Hi, everybody. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, everybody. I see Barry. I see Robert. Hey, Susan. Hi, Lucinda, Shauna, Jessica, Lynn. Good morning. Hey, Leslie, Greg. And hi, Josh. And Lynn. Hi, Gail. Here comes Carol. Great. You all are very punctual people. We appreciate it. We even have one whole minute <laughs> to go. We'll start in just a moment. Wanted to make sure everybody has um, some pieces of blank paper, at least probably three, a pen or a pencil, since we're going to get started in our demo classes this morning. Also, maybe some water, snack, you know, get, get comfy. Jessica's got her coffee, her tea, maybe. Great. All right. Anybody else waiting in the waiting room there, Nathan? I don't think so. Right? All right. Well, let's get started. We're all here. This is wonderful. Again, I'm Julie Klein, Education and Associate, Lifetime Arts. I'm here with Jane Stauffer, my partner in crime, partner in training. Uh, and we have some other great folks to introduce you to today. Um, but just a reminder, Nathan Majoro, the deputy director is here. Annie Montgomery, director of education. Uh, and we'll introduce some others in just a moment. Um, so here are our goals for today's session. Today's a fun session. We're gonna look at best practices in creative aging in-person programming, uh, in design specifically of creative aging in-person classes. Uh, we hope you're going to walk away understanding both that in-person model and then how best to adapt that model to remote delivery, um, including up and prep. So remote delivery would be, um, you know, online, just like we are today, or over the phone or other asynchronous methods. And we're also going to spend some time talking about older adult communities um, and discuss some best practices when working with uh, those partners. Here's our agenda today, how it's going to look. So we're gonna start right off uh, with an hour long MO class in SAFE planning. So you're both gonna experience the class as a participant would, and you're also gonna get some information on the techniques that the artist, teaching artist is using related to the SAFE planning elements that we talked about yesterday. Then we'll take a quick break. Then we'll go into a presentation on program design best practices and those adaptations for remote delivery. We'll take a quick stretch break. Then we'll go to, into our presentation and a little bit of a discussion on partnering with older adult communities, different types of communities you might come in contact with and best ways to partner, especially right now um, during the pandemic. Finally, we'll have a great Q&A se session, a robust Q&A moment and some wrap up. Just a reminder on our Zoom protocols, uh, we would love for you to keep your cameras on. We love seeing the faces. It's really helpful to feel like we're a community here in the Zoom room. And I see that almost everybody does, so I really appreciate that. Please keep your microphones muted unless asked to unmute, which you are gonna be doing for sure, unmuting and, and talking in your breakout group demo classes in just a moment. When the screen is shared, like right now, we really recommend you put the view into the side-by-side -side mode. So again, up at the top, there's a green bar that says you are viewing Nathan's screen. And if you click view options there, you can go to side-by-side -side mode. Go ahead and add any questions or comments, you know, when they occur to you in the chat um, and Nathan's gonna collect them for a final Q&A. I even have a question that was caught, I caught yesterday. We didn't get to answer that we will answer in the Q&A today. Breakout room discussions are going to be used specifically in um, demo classes this morning, so just be ready to fully participate in those. And if you wouldn't mind, please take a moment right now to rename yourself. Uh, you can add your preferred pronouns. You can put your art forms. Just make sure that you know your your name is nice and clear um, in the little Zoom name bar there. Great. And now Dane's going to introduce uh, you to our demo class teachers. Excellent. Thank you, Julie. And hello, everybody. It's good to see you here again today. Um, so as Julie mentioned, we're going to have experiential classes. You've elected to be in one of 
one of these two classes or we've elected you for you. And um, uh, this is how it's gonna work. The class, as we mentioned yesterday, we usually recommend a 90 minute period at least. This will be about 40 minutes. So obviously it will be a truncated class. We'll move through a curriculum. Um, Daniela and Jade, who I'm going to introduce to you in a second, will be leading the class. And Julie and I will be um, annotating it. So you're going to participate in the class as though you're a student. The teacher will be the teacher. Occasionally we will press pause on the class and we'll reset as fellow teachers talking about what just happened. How did we use social engagement, assessment, feedback, protocols, et cetera. So we'll, we'll occasionally pause to be able to, um, to comment on, on how this is addressing the criteria that we talk about. Uh, so participate as though it's a real class, be a student, and then occasionally we will pause and we'll talk about uh, it as fellow teachers about what we're doing. So uh, for those of you who are in the uh, visual arts class, you will need a few sheets of blank paper. You'll need a writing utensil, a pen or a pencil. For those of you who are gonna take the dance, you'll need to move. So I'd like to introduce these two um, uh, our guest teachers today. Daniela Del Giorno is a longtime creative aging teaching artist, teaching ballroom and Latin dance in New York City area to all ages for the past 18 years. We also have Jade Lam joining us. Jade is a New York based Chinese brush painting artist and regularly conducts Chinese brush painting classes and workshops at senior facilities, at museums, and other nonprofit and private organizations. So I believe without any further ado, we will break into our classes. Is that, is that right? All right, are we back? Welcome back. Can't wait to hear more about the dance class. We had a wonderful um, Chinese painting slash drawing class with Jade in our group. Um, but right now we're gonna take a break. Um, so we're gonna take a good five minute break. That means that you all will be back uh, at 1010 Mountain Time. Am I right? 1010 Mountain Time. Um, if any other questions or, or comments or things I saw, you know, already folks putting stuff in the pulp put a comment in the chat. Any questions or comments for a teaching artist, please go ahead and put them in the chat. We will collect them. Um, but th these folks are gonna leave us in just a minute. So if you have any specific questions for them and you wanna put them in the chat, please do. But we have an open break. Nathan's gonna play some music and we'll meet you back here at 10. Thank you all so much. Great, I saw some questions in the chat and, and Jade and Danielle are here for one more minute so they can go ahead and answer those directly. That would be wonderful. And then these other questions, um, we're going to collect for Q&A that we'll have just at the end of the session today. It feels like those that were in Daniela's class are like energized and exercised, and those of us that were in Jade's class are like connected, have like an inner light and are meditative and connected to nature. So it's <laughs> really great. <laughs> great, Dan, you want to take us away? There is a question here for Daniela and, and uh, from Hillary wondering, how would you adapt a class like this for people in wheelchairs? Or, or really in generally just making adaptations to different abilities 
Yeah, that would be great, Danielle. If you want to just type that directly into the chat, that would be wonderful. And Jade, the question for you it too, is that here, way we all can see um, it. From Hillary. Uh, great, great. I'm yeah, so I'm just going to have them answer those. Classes. Yeah, I'm going to have them answer those in the chat, Dane, just so we, because we oh, have I got it. at the moment. I have Danielle right. answer in the chat, got it. Thank yeah, you. that would be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. Um, now uh, we're we're going to uh, take a little bit closer look at creative aging program design. We're going to look at the elements that teaching artists need to ensure are present, whether delivered in person or on the phone or online. We've alluded to some of these yesterday. Now we're going to dig in. In preparation for designing a uh, creative aging program, keep these best practices in mind. First of all, this is going to be an art class that meets every week for eight weeks. The expectation and the goal is that your students will come every week. Of course, things come up, people get sick, but the goal is that the same group of students will come week after week. Why? Because the class is sequential in nature. One skill will build upon the other and the learning and the practice of the skills will grow over time. Those of you who are in the dance class can imagine somebody missing today and coming next week and we're going to review today. That's problematic. Then the teacher has to stop the class and go back or um, therefore we uh, advocate that students should officially register for the class and commit to coming for every session. This class will meet at the same time, same place every week. And finally, there will be a planned culminating event that will be a celebration of the work created over the eight weeks that will be shared with the community members. This is a model we've developed working originally in public libraries, but it is applicable to most community-based organizations. All the approaches to the program planning must keep the community that you're trying to reach in mind, obviously. Where, what are the art forms that might be culturally appealing to the community? And if you don't know, you can always ask. <laughs> um, teaching artists should speak the same language of the participants in the program. Obviously, if the majority of the community speaks Spanish, the teaching artists should also speak Spanish. Um, <clears throat> speak to my own experience in this topic. Well, I, mine, mine is a more general, again, I've had um, people, I, I've had people who um, were of different abilities in terms of hearing and speaking. Um, we had, I had in one course, I had someone who, uh, there was a, a bit of dementia and she, spoken in, in kind of her own language. And I was able to, I was blessed to have, she had a very good friend in her in the class who understood her language and interpreted the language for her, for the class. And so in tandem, they created a way to perform her stories that um, was spellbinding. Um, that was a, a kind of a blessing. And obviously when there's um, in-person program is impossible, there's many opportunities to continue to engage with older adults in arts education. We've obviously, here we are on remote delivery formats. We have a, a question I'm gonna post in the chat, but the question is, how have you been engaging students, older adults or otherwise remotely during this time? Have you, and if so, how? Yeah, Zoom. Great, Carol says Zoom. Hmm? Yes, Zoom. I have met one-on-one -on -one with some people in their homes, masked, socially distanced for people who feel comfortable with like, um, you know, their children will give the, 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 the thumbs up, <laughs> but on rare occasion. Great, thanks, Jessica. So 
So, so I did a, a presentation for Photo Plus Plus Convention, which is normally held in Javits in New York. I did. I had 266 registered uh, to attend my session, so it was an hour long. But it's Zoom. Uh, it was a webinar, basically. But that was my first. My second will be March 25th with BNH Photo um, for their event space program. And, and this is all, once again, I'm working on a grant from Wyoming Arts Council, a professional development grant to help me improve my Zoom. And I have a class, a gilding class with Lander Art Center, but it's not, and that's on the 30th of March. And that's gonna be interactive like this, interactive remote uh, class, but, but it's not an age specific thing. Sure, no, that's, that's great, Barry, thank you. But it's gilding, it's for gilding. It's introduction to gilding, cool. 90 minutes. Great. We worked with uh, kids on the reservation and in uh, Riverton, and they don't have uh, reliable internet. And with kids, you don't know that their parents want them to be messing around with that. So we we made kits and we sent them home, and um, we established a basic toolkit that everybody had, so we could make assignments based on the materials we knew that they had, and it, uh, everything was hands on and we try to have as little talking as possible and just making. <laughs> great, great. Well, it's wonderful to hear about everybody's different examples and, and, and adaptations. Um, we, we've heard a lot of these you know, similar stories and we wanted to share one, which is uh, uh, Deborah Pascaret is a manager of community engagement at the Wallace Annenberg Center um, for Performing Arts in, in Beverly Hills. And um, this is on this next slide here, Nathan, uh, they were, they teach a storytelling memoir writing class for older adults, and they were preparing for their culminating event, you know, right when COVID hit. And so Deborah designed a totally different curriculum, uh, really a, an extended curriculum. Um, and the students can continue to meet, you know, every week for two hours, hours via Zoom. And this is pretty unusual. We often hear people are meeting for shorter times on Zoom, but in this case, Deborah was really responding to the students' needs to stay connected during this time. And so they shared writing assignments, um, and she altered many of them to, to really focus on what's life like now during COVID. Um, and they utilized uh, writing prompts and they read their work aloud and shared feedback on these Zoom calls. Um, Deborah also did, a, did something that a lot of people are doing when working online is she opened up the, the video conference early, you know, the Zoom early, a good half an hour, 20 minutes early so that folks can kind of enjoy an unstructured time and maybe ask particular questions, especially any tech support questions which is a really, uh, also just an important moment. to. to I think that's a very, that. very smart idea, opening at least 15 minutes early. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the two webinars, I, I, or the first one I did, they didn't open early. It was just like on, it was like television, boom. It was a little bit eh, shocking. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, Barry. It actually then doesn't feel as interactive, all right? It feels more like just a show. And we want to continue to make sure that things are really interactive, even in these remote formats. Um, also, like Annie had just put in the chat, also a time to maybe to maybe focus the tech support issues or questions mm -hmm. in that time so that they don't get in the way of class. Um, so yes. we have some recommendations, though, in terms of just art form adaptations overall when working remotely. And I'm sure since so many of you have worked remotely, um, you're probably already figuring out some of these adaptations. You're, of course, going to need to think about your art form choice in terms of what's going to be most successful in these formats. So you know yourselves as teaching artists, you're often skilled in many aspects of a single art form. So you know, think about how your, your specific curriculums might be adapted. Uh, a big challenge, and Jade was just speaking about this in her demo class, you know, uh, you may be taught painting in a studio with lots of supplies on hand, and now it's harder to get those physical supplies to participants at home. So adaptation might be, you know, it becomes a drawing program where students use pencil, pen, paper, maybe the class because becomes collage because those that uses materials that are more accessible at home. Um, we found that group classes when working remotely tend to become more individually focused. So, you know, an example is a choir class and people are still doing choir classes online, amazingly. Um, but generally the focus becomes vocal technique for the individual singer rather than of course, blending as a group, which is virtually impossible in the Zoom format. Um, multidisciplinary forms are an option. so. We've heard of artists that, you know, maybe their focus is dance and they do still do dance, but they might incorporate some poetry writing based on the movement so that half of the class is in something that's a little bit easier in the remote format. You might focus in on, you know, one or two skills or main learning concepts. So, 
in a music class again, maybe the focus becomes more music theory rather than playing instruments together as a, as a big group. And we've also heard about many artists that are, you know, you are really, you know, focusing in on the COVID crisis or the experience of living during this pandemic as a, as a great theme or topic for, for work in these classes. So we have, um, we have different modalities here. The, the synchronous learning, obviously where we're meeting every week, uh, we are building on the social engagement, we're building in the feedback, we're uh, skill building, it's, it's scaffolded so that we're building towards the culmination. And then as part of this remote learning, uh, especially, but even when we're learning uh, live, there is what we call asynchronous learning. The uh, resources, the links, the materials, the activities that students complete on their own time. Um, this may be individually, this may be, I know for me, I scheduled meetups with my storytelling students during the midweek, during the week where they would practice with each other and practice giving feedback to each other. And this became for them um, one of the highlights of the week. There's a lot of uh, resources available for, for you to assist you when you're thinking about your online programs. And we're gonna put the, these, as many of these as we can into the chat. But the first link, includes more information on the combination of asynchronous and synchronous learning. It's also known as bichronous learning. I'm learning all these terms. Also, we add to the link, there's national experts in older adult technology support. These are wonderful resources. If you're not familiar with them, please um, tap in. OATS is the acronym, Older Adults Technology Service. And now they are affiliated with AARP, so they're not going away. And if you want to read more about broadband access for older adults, we're including a link for Aging Connected. Great. So as Dane was mentioning, you know, those these asynchronous elements are, are a way for the learner to engage more deeply in their own time with the art form that they're studying in the synchronous classes with you as a teaching artist. A great um, part of asynchronous opportunities is that they can really free up the synchronous class to maybe be more discussion, feedback, that social engagement time with the teaching artist and you know with each other. So some other ideas for asynchronous content would be you know instructional videos that the teaching artists themselves can create or can source from elsewhere on the internet, um, artist professional bios and work, watching films, listening to music scores, virtual museum tours, everything on this list. Um, what's important, Dane just put into the chat as well. Um, universal design guidelines. So it's just important to keep those in mind when you're creating any resources that may be slides or maybe video presentations, um, making sure that everything is, is legible and readable and, and those guidelines are there in that link. So of course, these, all these asynchronous examples and suggestions are fabulous, um, but they don't, they're not gonna necessarily promote that social engagement time, right? These are things that you, one would do on one's own so we need to continue to think about how, what are some ways we can have asynchronous time that builds social connection. So Dane was actually speaking about one a moment ago, which is he pairs students outside of class to go over their stories, right, over the, so that's a great example. What are some other ways, you know, outside of full group meetings that we can still plan out opportunities for our students to connect with each other over the art form? Um, it's great to, you know, talk to your students about, about this, but there, he, these are some examples. So just like Dane said, students might meet via telephone between classes to um, share their work, like say if it's poetry or storytelling and that's easy to do over the phone, or just um, talk about a specific resource. You know, So maybe you have shared something that they, they should read or view and then they can call each other and talk um, you know, with some prompts that you give them, talk about the work. Um, they can also just talk about their, their process. You know, how has it been going working on that painting this week? Um, and to give feedback and support to each other. Um, teaching artists have also been starting, you know, discussion boards, maybe chat boards, um, uh, you know, on, on whatever sort of format is comfortable for everybody, where uh, a teacher might, you know, post uh, a piece of work and people then can comment, you know, and, and respond to each other about the work over the week between the classes. And finally, students can also meet for scheduled office hours. So Jade mentioned this in her 
um, in her remote class earlier. These are, this is time when individual students can either via phone or via Zoom meet with the teaching artist one-on-one -on -one for specific feedback and coaching. I did that with a class that I taught, um, a Zoom movie class, and those you know 20 minute phone conversations I had with each person. Why are they coming to the class? What scene are they working on? It was super vital because as we all know in the Zoom meeting, we're kind of all in this big group and it, it, it can be much, very difficult to get those sort of individual conversations going. So you don't have to do these kinds of things every week, but, but definitely need to be a part of a remote program in creative aging to really grow these connections between participants. What about Instagram? Uh, an option, um, you know, as with any kind of um, the possibility of, of apps, we wanna make sure that everybody has equal access and can, you know, that nobody's left out of engaged in, in these different formats. But we can talk more about that, Barry, at the end. I, I've found, you know, I'm finding that people have very strong opinions about social media and, and they're on one, but not on the other and so forth. So I've, I'm, um, I've, right, I've never been on Facebook ever. I've tried to make that work and I've just gone back to email and phone for huh. me, but that's, um, and so just moving on, uh, as always, we, uh, Lifetime Arts still recommends, as we've talked about before, a sequential model for arts learning when online, where skills are built over time. That being said, we understand that there are, are, are adaptations that are, are appropriate and beneficial to online and other remote learning environments. This is a call that you have to make. We've got a PDF with these adaptations suggestions. It was part of your asynchronous resources for this session. So you have a link to review this PDF with asynchronous and synchronous options and modalities. But again, we're always building towards that culmination. We're building a foundation and then building on those skills. So we recommend that there are eight or more sessions for online or other remote programs. We still recommend at least four synchronous sessions with the possibility of asynchronous elements added to continue the learning outside of the class. And these are just suggestions. So the exact amount of synchronous sessions are variable, obviously gear it towards your constituents. We're also aware of programs that are scheduled in a condensed camp format, a, a weekend, a three day in a row, where there are a series of synchronous classes, one day for a week or for two weeks. I have one class that I'm just doing in three days. That's the intro. If they like it, then they sign up for the eight weeks. And that works for Common Bond. Um, in our in-person model, sessions are a minimum of 90 minutes long, minimum of 90 minutes long. We see a big trend in remote formats to shorten classes to 45, 45 to 75 minutes in many cases. Um, focus is different being watched and watching your eyes. Be sure to assess with your students how long they think the class should be. And if you decide to keep the classes to 90 minutes or more, include breaks during that period. Some of this is just your assessment and your ability to assess how's it going and um, adapting as needed. We spoke yesterday about minimum sizes for in-person programs for remote classes. Class size should still be appropriate to the art form. Um, manageable teacher to student ratios are, are very important. Just because an online platform can accommodate 100 people, it does not mean a class would maintain creative aging goals at that size. I know for me, I could teach 20 students live with a, a, a storytelling class and I'm finding online that about half of that is workable, max. Um, finally, as we mentioned yesterday, another aspect of creating aging programming is the culminating event. Culminating events should be an opportunity for the participants to show the work that they've done it validates their process and the work and its example for other older adults in their community of the visibility, the value and the voice. Other people might get interested in what they're doing. It's good to have a clear vision of what you want for your culminating event, but know that it's also going to be developed fully in partnership with the students. And if you're working with an organization, they might wanna have some input as well. 
make sure that it is appropriate to the art form. Big or small events are fine. Uh, we're talking obviously about you know live and remote, but they should be intentional and they should be well thought out so that you can anticipate uh, the needs and the logistics as much as you can. Um, uh, Culminating an event is a great opportunity, obviously, to build community, to engage family and friends, to recruit students for future classes, bring visibility to fundraising needs. In this way, culminating tools are a great tool to aid in the sustainability of the whole program long term. Finally, the culminating event fights ageism. It makes the older adults visible to the community and it reminds everyone that they're still contributing uh, and vital citizens who deserve to have their voice and their presences at all the tables in the community. I'm also going to quickly add that a culminating event for me is a powerful teaching tool that for storytellers, the kind of the, oh, I'm nervous and the, and the addressing everything that comes up in relation to the up impending performance is directly related to the skills I'm building. So I, I think that that impending show is a powerful teaching tool. For remote programs, look into the ways you can still share the work that was created in some kind of culminating event. Online website galleries for visual arts are an option or pre-recorded video projects that can be shared with family or friends via a website link. I recorded my student stories and we did a podcast. You can invite friends and family to a sharing via Zoom conference where you have an audience watching and applauding in between. You could do, if you're doing a telephone program, you can invite people to the conference line to listen to the work. You can be creative, include your older adult student in the planning. They might have wonderful ideas that didn't occur to you so they can still share their work with their community and have that validation and that you know, culmination. Here's a, uh, an example of a remote culminating event. It's an online virtual gallery. In March, the Museum of History, Anthropology, and Art of the University of Puerto Rico wanted to highlight their students' work in a very special way, to especially acknowledge their successful pivot from beginning their creative aging program in person, and then jumping to an online program when the pandemic hit. It's Amazing what a difference it made for the students to see the artwork on the walls, even virtually. You can see that this just puts the seal in the deal. This, uh, this kind of virtual exhibit could be used with your participants in visual arts classes. Um, you'll need to work with them on how best to take the pictures of their work, the logistics of, of lighting and so forth, so that it shows up well in this virtual gallery setting. And um, here's an example of a remote culminating event that was done asynchronously by me uh, for three years. So I worked with these st students for about three years at the Park Square Theater in St. Paul. Um, Park Square had a financial crunch in the fall of 2019. They shelved their education program. I had a conversation with them asking for their blessing to continue teaching on my own because that was, you know, had become one of my jobs. And they said, absolutely. Um, I was gonna start my classes on March 17th, right when the COVID hit. So I said, okay, folks, let's try this Zoom thing. We had a Zoom party, a social event of getting together, meeting each other, talking about the pandemic, talking about how to use Zoom. And then we uh, ended up writing stories and telling stories about resilience. We, I have a former student of mine, Tony Lloyd, who worked with me. He was developing a podcast on his own called Thrive, Connect, Contribute. We recorded our studio, our story, we recorded our stories about resilience, just using their phones, whatever they had at home. We recorded them on Zoom. I sent them to Tony. He edited them. He published them. And our stories of resilience came out right in the midst of the civil unrest that was happening in Minneapolis. And um, 
was was got attention from the press and from our local um, public television station, I think because of the timeliness of it and because my students were willing to just say yes. And it took us about, it took about 45 minutes to get the Zoom thing down, but we're still meeting and we're just about to celebrate our one year Zoom celebration. And I'll share a link to those podcasts in the chat if you're interested. Great. Thanks, Dane. We wanted to also mention teleconference, of course, is also a format that can be used for remote delivery of creative aging programs. And um, telephone, of course, may be even more accessible to some older adults than online programs. So there's lots of ways to explore many different art forms via the telephone. Believe it or not, we know of dance and arts programs that are currently being done with older adults over the phone. Of course, you're gonna to need to think about clearly about how this um, can be done. And in many cases, it's gonna require much more prep, right? That written instructions may be being sent to folks before they call in, um, maybe also supplies. A dance teaching artist might need to instruct, you know, the participants how to put the phone on speaker so that everybody can move easily. And you'll need to adjust your class plans to the phone format. You, of course, because you can't see the group, you're gonna to need to focus on each individual one at a time. Um, so it's, it'll be important to tailor and design prompts that, you know, where folks can really work independently. Um, you're not, of course, folks are not going to be all singing together. Instead, you're going to focus on, you know, what is the skill that each, each student needs to be learning that day. Um, but we've definitely heard of, we have a storytelling teaching artist. We work with Robin Baby, Beatty, who was able to, um, with, with the program that they were using, the organization was using, um, they actually had breakout groups inside of a phone call. So people could press a certain thing and go into breakout groups. So she did have breakout groups for people sharing their stories and doing feedback. So check with systems that might be able to do that. And Robin also hosted a culminating event where it was you know, a phone number that folks shared with their friends and family and everybody called in and was able to hear all of the stories that were shared. And of course, snail mail um, is, can be used to engage older adults in remote arts programming. Um, and this is a project specifically that, that kept skill building and social engagement at the core. It was, um, excuse me, created by Minnesota Conservatory for Arts. And it was a project called Art in a Box. And in the project, participants created artwork each week on postcards that they then sent to each other with special messages about their process. So the way this worked is before the program even began, the instructor sent each student a curriculum packet. And I know folks have been talking about art kits. It was sort of like that with a booklet that highlighted a different topic each week, like line, shape, color, and tracing. And the packet also included all the materials they would need. So the postcards, the pens, the stamps even, et cetera. And so social engagement was really boosted because folks would create some artwork and then send it to each other and then give feedback to each other. And the staff also followed up with weekly e emails and they had a Google folder where you could click in and then you could see everybody's postcard. So the project was really successful and, and the conservatory is now planning for a second round. Okay, we're gonna move into another presentation. I see some great resources are being traded in the chat on um, uh, Dane put in his uh, podcast links and then Senior Planet, um, which again is related to older adults, uh, Technology services has really wonderful support specifically on helping older adults um, access and, and understand how to work on Zoom. So those are all in the chat for you all. But we're gonna do a quick stretch break. Just gonna lead this nice and quickly. We're gonna sit, we're gonna place our feet on the floor where they should be, nice and grounded. We're gonna place our hands on our on our thighs, nice and easy. Mm -hmm. Great. So you're really grounded into your feet, you're really letting your bottom sit strongly and deeply into your chair. And I just attached some little balloons to your fingers. And both are going up. Sorry, both should be going up. I'm just adjusting my view for myself. Um, okay, great. Going up. Good, good, good. Going up, 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 up. So your bottom is going deeper into your chair, but your fingers are going up, 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 up. up. So it's almost from belly button down of going into the earth for belly button up is going up, 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 really good. And it's almost like I clipped those balloons and you just fall to your wrists. Everything else still going up and you fall to your elbows. Good, and you fall down to your shoulders. And now you let your head fall gently forward. Whoa, I don't know if you, my earphones just picked up that crick in my neck. Good, and now go ahead and bring one Ear to one shoulder, rolling up. Good, let your head come down front. The other ear to the other shoulder. 
Roll again down to the front, first ear to first shoulder, to the front, and then one all the way around gently to the back. Come back to it, release to the front. I now I've attached a balloon to the crown of your head. Big helium balloon, and that's letting your head float up. Keep letting your feet go down, but your head is floating up. Good. Just roll your shoulders back. And shake out your hands. Nice. All right, let's push on. So in creative aging programs, generally you're almost always going to be working in partnership, right? You're gonna be working in partnership um, sites and often in new communities. So we're gonna, Dane's gonna talk, talk, take you through um, the different types of older adult communities um, that you might come in contact with when doing this work. So some examples are a senior center, retirement communities, assisted living communities, and NORCs. And Dane's gonna take us through that. Yes, Julian, I'm sure you've all had experiences with a variety of older communities. We've basically broken them down into three types listed here. The first type is what we would call aging in place examples, meaning that a senior will continue to keep living in their current home, modifying it to address any mobility issues, working with home health care professionals to get assistance where needed. Age restricted communities are housing options where residence is limited to people over a certain age. I live in a 55 plus. Assisted living is a senior living option that combines apartment style housing, organized social interaction and private duty support and health services are, are as needed. Some residents may have memory disorders, including Alzheimer's, or they may need help with mobility or other challenges. Then there are skilled nursing facilities, sometimes known as nursing homes, served as, they serve as licensed healthcare residences for individuals who require a higher level of medical care than can be provided in an assisted living facility. Then there are continuous care retirement communities. This is a combination of independent living, assisted living, and a nursing home. These are campuses and they generally gather all levels of care under one property with individuals receiving whatever level of care they may need. And finally, there are senior centers. These are non-residential. They offer a, a free or a low cost lunch. They sometimes have breakfast to seniors who sign up as members. Many centers offer fitness programs, computer programs and other activities, including the arts. Though many senior centers are closed currently during the pandemic, most continue to offer meals and social services to their members, and many are aiming to continue their program activities in, in some way, shape, or fashion. Beyond what we've talked about, older adults gather in person or remotely, obviously, in all sorts of places. Think about those listed on the slide. Many groups are looking to support the older adults that they serve or who are in their community with programming. Many of these communities want to have this programming, whether it's in person or remote. And creative aging programs are a great fit for these the benefits that they provide to the older adult students. As a, a teaching artist, obviously, you can only do so much. Successful programs, especially in creative aging, depend on strong partnerships such as with a senior service organization, a library, or a senior center. The stronger the partnerships that you can build at the beginning, the more likely your program will become sustainable. So it helps to be very intentional and clear with your partners about what your program ideas are and to make sure that your goals are aligned with their goals. That way the partnership will be mutually beneficial. Partnerships with these organizations can allow you to attract new audiences, identify potential students, recruit students. It can assist with the marketing of the program, diversify funding sources. It can provide you with technical support and host programs if they're remote. They'll support you throughout the class sessions and hopefully help you continue to make the program to continue it if it's successful. 
I've always appreciated the, the help with the administrative details and the follow through and the spreadsheets of names and numbers. You could consider partnering with synagogues, churches, clubs, community organizations, senior service organizations, recreational facilities, etc. cetera. Um, as I'm sure you've heard of, you're aware of at this time, many senior service organizations are stretched very thin and may not have the capacity to prioritize arts programming. When you're building a new partnership, it's good to reach out and discuss ways in which your combined efforts might serve these older adults in the community. Be uh, patient and adaptive and really listen to what their needs are and respecting their limited resources. At the end of the day, their relationship to the older adults in their community will be what connects you to the students and your partner's knowledge and experience about who to reach and how to reach them is it's invaluable. If the staff needs encouragement, you might offer gentle reminders about how arts programs can help ease the social isolation and arts skill development can ignite a sense of purpose for folks. Great, thank you, Dane. We're gonna um, go straight to the Q&A now. So because we've got a little more time about any of the subjects that we went over today. It was a big day. We had demo classes first thing, then we talked about program design, both in-person and then adaptations for rooms. Then we talked about older adult communities and the different kinds of communities you might partner with and the ways partnerships can really help these programs. So with all that in mind, I already have some, some Q&A, some questions that already came in. I know Leslie asked yesterday, um, after a project is set up, are the artists responsible for recruiting pretend? So um, this is a great, this, I'm so glad we're talking about this now, actually, after we just talked about partnership, right? Ideally, you're working in partnership, you know, with, the, with some other, with an organization. Um, in this case, say for this initiative, it'd be with a library, right? So in that case, it really is the library's first um, responsibility to recruit um, participants. I think there's a lot of ways in which a teaching artist can support that. Um, I know a lot of the work that I've done, um, and also Daniela and Jade, who were here earlier, and Annie is in um, you know, senior centers in New York City. And I really was a part of the recruitment in the sense, it was really a partnership, you know, where the, the senior center, um, you know, uh, program director would definitely list of the folks she thinks would be interested. I also would come to lunch, lunches, I came to many, many lunches and just walked around and talked with people, got people interested in knowing me um, in, in you know, this crazy theater project that I was working on. So that was a really important part. Um, sometimes some recruitment, uh, other ideas is you might come and do a demo class. And so people you know, get a chance to experience that, maybe just do an artist talk. Um, so, so definitely the teaching artist uh, is a part of it, but in the end, the, the organization, you know, planning the program, whether it be the library or a senior center um, or a senior service organization or the museum, um, you know, it is their primary task to do that recruitment. Now, if you're working on your own completely independently, you decided to start your remote, you know, program, visual arts program, storytelling program, then of course that would be up to you without a supporting organization. Um, and you would need to do that recruitment of new participants. And yeah, Julie, if I may, it also depends on the organization somewhat. I have, uh, common bond with whom the students are all from within the, the facility. The, the person who lives on site was very instrumental in helping to recruit people, to nudge people, to gently nag them. I think, Sandra, you should take this. You know, she was pivotal. Um, my work with Park Square Theater, I was a partner in the promotion of it as well as the delivery of it. I made little videos. I talked to my constituents, my students. I was interested in helping Park Square build their program. So I wanted to bring, you know, my, what following I might have to their table. Right, that's great. That's a great point, Dane, right? So as teaching artists, sometimes we start to get folks that wanted to take our classes and so we might, you know, bring that, that contact list into our work with an organization, but it really is a partnership in terms of that recruitment piece. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to flag Barry's question in terms of um, his library and Barry, you know, definitely Nathan has that down and maybe you two can connect about that because we definitely um, want to follow up with that. Um, but Shauna had a question about 
typically to teach up a supply list or a place for students to pick up or order supplies. And Shauna, um, is this regard with regards to a remote program? You there, Shauna? Sorry, I can't see you. She's nodding her head. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, yes. Yeah, so this works a bunch of different ways, and maybe Nathan, you could you could talk about this too, because I don't know as much from the visual arts side, but it does work a lot of different ways. So sometimes um, materials are shipped to people. Sometimes um, they might make a supply list and say, here are the things you could buy. If you don't can't buy these things, here are some substitutions you might work from home. You might you know use from home. Um, sometimes the organization is able to provide supplies. Sometimes they might you know forward someone to a low cost alternative. Um, and there and organizations have worked this a lot of different ways. Sometimes people are actively bringing supplies to participants like driving around and dropping supplies off so it, it kind of runs the gamut. Nathan did you want to add anything else about that? Yeah I think that that you covered basically all of it. I think again this goes to uh, who the partner is um, ultimately um, you know with this initiative in libraries there is understanding that um, uh, there is one um, funding to purchase supplies and then tapping in really into logistics of how things are currently happening. So with library, um, like curbside pickup is a thing and they are able to tap into to things like that or perhaps they can um, mail it as well. So there, there are options, um, but I think that really figuring out, um, you know, if it's done in partnership, what can the partner do? If I'm doing this on my own independently, um, then yes, thinking about, about maybe before in advance, here's a material list. Uh, but I think that the sort of lowest common denominator specifically for remote is also what Julie talked about was what, what typically can people find at home and how can I adapt my uh, instruction to work with pencil and paper uh, or what other materials you're working with and not sort of try to think about I need a kiln and ceramics, like how can we get to the lowest common denominator if you're working independently? Yeah, and we should say for in person, you know, definitely we'll go over this tomorrow, but you know, supply budget is part of the budget for the program. You know, it really, those supplies um, are, are really important and, and should be a conversation with the organization running the program. We're talking about, you know, adaptations for remote, like Nathan was saying, you know, just making sure things are adjustable, but definitely for in-person, we want these programs to su be supported with the necessary supplies. Um, Maria question. asked, oh. sorry. Oh, I, about a cooking yeah. class, is that what you were yeah. so I was asking about a cooking class and Jen and everyone, I think, you know, again, this is, this is perfect because you could do it as a drop-in type class, it would be interesting to contemplate and play with how would I make a sequential eight week course out of a cooking class? Are there I, concepts yeah. I introduce in week one that would be that would build on two and three? I, you know, so, so again, great, I think um, anything can be constructed that way. Sorry, Julie. Sure, no, it's fine, Dane. I just want to make sure that a, a cooking class doesn't doesn't qualify though for a creative aging program in our books. Right. And we, this comes up a lot, like culinary arts. I mean, I get it. Not to say that cooking is not creative because it totally is. It just doesn't kind of follow fall within our framework of the the types of programs that sort of go under this model. Um, so I want to take a cooking class, but I, I wouldn't include it in this like this initiative specifically or or under our arts education. Yeah, Nathan. One thing that if this is a sort of um, expressed need from the community, uh, think about how you can bridge the gap about if it's a storytelling class and you're incorporating, um, you know, themes of cooking, the focus, the skill building is storytelling. Homework assignment might be, you know, make your favorite dish, write a story about it, you know, like how can you bridge the gap, but specifically the sort of um, skill building of culinary arts, um, just doesn't fall as as really said within the framework right now you have to say cooking as a theme and i'm sure dana's come up in your storytelling and for me i mean i did an intergenerational play all about food because the yes. you know recipes getting passed down through generations or you know this generation you know all we may all we use mayonnaise and everything in this generation we never do whatever there's a lot of you know cooking comes yes. up is a pretty fascinating topic um, it really so is and sure it's amazing topic. how often food comes up in our stories as a as a cultural you know a cultural template a lot of things yep. yes yeah so yeah so great jen i'm glad we got that clarity though on that um some good questions for jade and daniela that i think we um we were able to address okay so that was what came in through the chat 
now we've got a little more time. Any other any other questions? Things that are coming up on about our many topics we went over today. Yeah, Barry. Yeah, you know uh, the, the structure of of how to teach. Uh, I've benefited tremendously from watching uh, Jade or for participating in what Jade did and then what you folks are doing otherwise. So we can we can go back and view these again or or is there somebody mentioned a PDF or something like that somewhere that that contains lots of information. Where is all that yeah. stuff? So that's all in the portal, Barry. Have you been were you you going through the portal to be able to access the Zoom links? Oh no! I you know it's an email. I put it in archive, and when it's gotcha, you know, ten minutes before a poom, I get on. <laughs> sure, I totally get it. So Nathan is we can support you with this. He's going to put his sure. um, email into the chat. Um, so we have we all we went over this a little bit yesterday, but there's basically like an online site that you can log into, that you have your own particular login to, and it's going to have resources, some videos, um, supporting PDFs. Um, and eventually all the recordings of the sessions there in this online portal. So I is that on Lifetime Arts? It's, it's called lifetimeartsportal.org. And Nathan can, if you email Nathan, um, he, can, he can connect you. Um, but, and also, but I will say the recordings of the sessions though, we're not going to include the demo. They won't include the demo classes. So, right. um, Unfortunately, just because when we go into breakout rooms, the recording doesn't follow us. Um, but, uh, you know, that's we the can, most important we can part. Connect you. Yeah, <laughs> totally, of course. Well, not well, necessarily. planning things are, are there, but we know yeah. we can find out some other ways. Maybe, Annie, we can talk about um, those lesson plans or other ways that we can share more about the demo classes or connect you, you know, directly with Jade if you had questions about her process. I mean, we, you know, we train all of our teaching artists in those sort of elements and then everybody kind of adapts it to their own you know uses um so knowing the elements is key but but we could maybe connect you further so so like where am i finding out where say dane is teaching a class that's a good question that's a good question <laughs> let's think about that um we're, we're in we always are talking about how we can all stay connected as a cohort so and we i don't know where we stood on that nathan or nanny or we decided in terms of a contact list but in, if we are able to share contact list, then we could just connect you directly via email with Dane. We can give everybody's email, everybody's yeah. lifetime arts. So we'll do that tomorrow before we all like kind of leave, you know, after tomorrow's session, we'll, we'll be sure to get everybody's, get you our emails at least. Contacts. Yeah. Thanks, Barry. It's a great question. Though. Well, I don't think Dane was listed on lifetime oh. arts. Yeah, we'll, we'll get, yeah. his is D star lifetime arts, but we oh, can. Yeah. We can get him, we can get your info for sure. Laura, I just saw your hand, so I wanted to make sure. Yeah, I wanted to say that uh, we started a project, oh, about a year ago with the Fremont County Libraries, and it was to build a, a mobile trailer unit with kinds of equipment in it for art projects at the libraries. And then they had to drop out of it because libraries have been, the whole state of Wyoming is suffering quite a bit with, uh, budget cuts. But we, uh, the makerspace, which is where I work, we, we went ahead with it. We have found funding and we have lots of equipment. And so we've made the, we do have, and I would offer it available to artists in the Fremont County and Hot Springs County area that we have a trailer and we have lasers and printing presses and heat presses and uh, all kinds of equipment. We can, we can put it in, take it out. We can, we have, um, we don't, we might not be able to uh, provide a lot of supplies, but we do have equipment and people, we could certainly haul it to the library for people or they can come and get it. It's not that big of a trailer. Who do you work with, Lori? Great. The Makerspace 307, we're, our space is currently in Riverton. We have a space here, but um, we're, we're building out a mobile unit so that it can go to different sites with equipment. That's really exciting, Laura. So again, I think tomorrow let's let's talk more about how we can all stay connected um, because we definitely want to and something like that where you have this incredible resource. Um, so, something comes up about a private Facebook group for sure. We're, let, let's all talk about tomorrow and also Jen, your question about uh, the libraries. I'm going to move till tomorrow too. Um, our folks from the Wyoming Arts Council are going to be back and we can definitely ask them those logistical questions. 
Um, I just wanted to go real quick over your homework. So again, this is on the portal. So that's why it's important, Barry, for you to connect with Nathan. Um, and we could also alternatively just email this directly to you. But this is a template for you to use um, to start to develop your own program, start to vision your own creative aging specific program. And has some questions just to take you through kind of your own processes as teaching artist and how you might adapt. Um, this is the template here, how you might adapt Great. what you've already been doing to fulfill sort of the, the precepts and elements that we've been presenting. Um, I can't force you to do the homework, of course, but I will say it, you're gonna get a lot more out of tomorrow's session because we're actually each going to, based on everything you've written, you're gonna be sharing out in a small group um, the things that you discovered about the program you'd like to teach. So you'll be a little bit out of luck if you haven't done some of your homework here. So of course, be in touch with Nathan directly if you have any issues with um, accessing the portal, but that is your final homework for tomorrow. And let's just do a quick closing. Let's again, just sit, we're wrapping up for today. We're gonna connect again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Just go ahead and sit again. Let your head float with that balloon. I'm gonna, just gonna have you take a breath on inhaling through your nose in four, one, two, three, four. Exhale through your mouth in four, one, two, three, for one more time, inhaling, one, two, three, four, just settling in all that information, exhaling, one, two, three, four. Good, letting all that good information and experience today settle into your body. And we will see you all again tomorrow. Thank you all so Thank much. You, we'll let everybody go. We're of course here if you have any last questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Enjoy the day. Thanks, Get out everyone. in the sun. Bye. Yes. Bye. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Bye. Thanks, Bye, Paul. Paul. Great to be in class with you. You good, Wendy? Any other questions? I'm just reading the chat box.